Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for uh, this webinar. Uh, we've entitled it Patents, Copyrights, and Trademarks, Oh My. And if you're familiar with The Wizard of Oz, you have to say that title to the tune of the song in your head every time you say it, because I do. Um, but you may be asking yourself, what are we going to be talking about? Well, essentially, what we're going to be talking about today are the various types of intellectual property uh, that are out there to um, protect various types of intellectual property, how they kind of apply, what they are, uh, and then talk about some that um, we don't handle regularly at OTC, but you may want to be aware um, just for reference. And then we'll go over some examples uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, specifically about software patents and how these types of intellectual property apply to them. Uh, so first, uh, what I want to talk about are these types of intellectual property and kind of where their genesis start started and how they're protected in the United States. Um, so generally, uh, the types of intellectual property are designed and why we have protection is to protect the ideas behind them, right? To protect embodiments of them, the ideas to make sure the originator of that idea uh, gets credit for that idea and is able to um, capitalize commercially from that idea. So with respect to patents and copyrights, that protection is found in the U.S. Constitution, right? So the very, you know, founding documents um, envision protection for uh, patents and copyrights. And we have a patent and copyright clause uh, that simply starts uh, by saying to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Uh, and again, this covers copyrights and patents. With respect to trademarks, uh, trademarks have been protected under common law uh, since colonial times. So with what do I mean by common law? Well, uh, in legal terms, you have two types of law. You have statutes, that are made by legislation and we have laws regarding them. And then you have common law, which is more judge made law at the time before things got codified. Uh, courts determined that there was this type of intellectual property and people were protecting it as such. So, you know, it's been around for a long time. However, in 1946, this trademark law was codified federally in what's known as the Lanham Act. And then we have trade secrets. Uh, trade secrets are traditionally governed by state law. So there may be state common law. There may be state statutes related to trade secrets. Uh, but in 2016, um, we passed the Defense of Trade Secrets Act on a federal level that allowed for a federal cause of action, meaning now companies could bring uh, suit related to trade secrets in federal court. And it gave us kind of this way to unify uh, trade secrets. However, there isn't a standard uh, federal trade secret law. So we're still operating under individual state laws when it comes to trade secrets. We just have the ability to avail ourselves of federal court. So now we'll go through kind of each one of these and, and what they are. So first, copyright, which is probably one of the most common forms of intellectual, I would say is the most common form of intellectual property. It's just a lot of times we don't appreciate that we have created a copyright. So what is it? In its most general terms, a copyright is a work of original authorship. So meaning you originally thought of it and created it. It could be literary work, sound recordings, pictorial, graphic, you know, a lot of other mediums as well fixed in a tangible medium of expression, right? So it has gone from your mind into some fixed form from which that idea can be perceived. Meaning someone else has to be able to, to see it, appreciate it, perceive it, right? Feel it, right? Depending on what it is. Um, and that can be in the form of books, paintings, pictures, software, brochures, websites, et cetera. Um, now that from which can be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated directly or with the aid of a machine or device. 
So with that definition, we've kind of gone to the point of, um, you know, not only is it direct, like you have the tangible book in your hand, but it could be a website because you're perceiving it through um, a, a computer. Um, you know, sound recordings have to be reproduced in some manner, not just live performance. Uh, so we've kind of wrapped that up and we have device, you know, that's why we include with the aid of a machine or device. So in general, that's what a copyright is. But if you have a copyright, what does a copyright give you the exclusive right to, right? If I say you have a copyright, what does that mean? Well, it means you're the only one that has the right to reproduce that work. So you're the only one that has rights to make copies of it. Meaning if you sell a book, no one else has the right to copy that. Only the owner of that copyright does. Two, you have the exclusive right to prepare derivative works. Let's say you write a textbook for you know, a particular topic and you do a second edition. Well, you're the only one that has a right to do that second edition because it's derivative from the first. Uh, another thing to think about also is translations, right? So if you're translating something from another language, that is a derivative work, and only the original copyright holder uh, would have the right to perform that translation. You're, the copyright holder is the only one that has rights to distribute copies, right? So if you went out and bought a painting, an original painting, you don't have the right to take a picture of that and give it away to somebody else. Only the original author of, you know, the original creator of that painting has the right to distribute copies of it. Uh, you have the right to publicly perform. So you can go out if, you know, music was what was created, you can go out and perform that. If it was a play, you have the right to perform that. No one else has the right to perform it publicly and to publicly display. So no one can you know, take your work and go and display it in public without your permission. So that's kind of what, you know, the, the bundle of rights that a copyright holder has. Um, the next thing is, you know, what is the term of this protection? When does it start? How long does it last? Uh, so copyright, unlike a lot of other rights, uh, happens almost automatically, right? In the sense that a copyright vests to the author at the moment it is created, right? So as an example, I was on a phone call yesterday and sat down and took notes from my meeting. I created a copyright the moment I took those notes. I have a copyright in those notes because I wrote it down. It's an expression of original authorship that is capable of being perceived, right? So we have registration for copyrights, but that is not required to be a copyright holder. So reg registration is not required. Although if you want to bring suit, if you want to sue someone to maybe get an injunction against them using it or to recoup monetary damages for someone's um, misappropriated use of your copyright, uh, oftentimes registration is required, but that can be done at the time. Now that we know that it vests, as soon as it's created, how long does it last, right? So you'll often hear, you know, people say, well, this is about ready to come into the public domain. Uh, and that is what this means. It's how long does the copyright holder have exclusivity over that bundle of rights? Uh, for instances, having an individual author, that time frame is normally life of the, of the author plus 70 years. Meaning upon the death of the original author, that copyright will exist for another 70 years and then it enters the public domain. And when that happens, that means those bundle of rights that the author originally had that we discussed earlier, the right to produce, reproduce, prepare derivative works gets opened up to everybody. So everyone can make copies at that point. So that is the time frame for an individual author. With respect to corporations, it is the lesser of 95 years from publication, meaning from when it was first you know, published in some form, or 120 years from creation. So whichever of those is less, that is the length of a copyright. So of 
of IP that has a definitive endpoint, copyright lasts by far the longest. Um, a lot of these times were kind of put forth by the entertainment industry, right? So um, with respect to that life plus 70 years, it's so that you know, the, the writer of a movie or the writer of a song will be able to recoup all the replays that happen after that song or movie was created uh, and recoup to their estate or whatever it may be. So we know kind of the rights you have with respect to copyright. We know when it starts, how long it lasts, but what does a copyright not protect, right? So, you know, it doesn't protect ideas, procedures, processes, systems, methods of operation, concept, principles, discovery. Essentially, at its heart, a copyright protects no facts, no underlying information. What a copyright protects, rather, is the expression of that idea, right? So how many poems do you know about love? No one can copyright the idea of love, but you can copyright a, a poet's expression of what love means to them, right? In an, another area, there are a number of maps, right? We, you cannot protect the shape you know, or boundaries of a country. That is what it is but the way that you color, the line weight that you use, the font that you use to label cities on that map could be protected. So again, a copyright doesn't protect the, the information contained therein, it protects the expression of that information. So we know now what bundle of rights a copyright holder has, how long it lasts, what it doesn't protect. But now we need to look a little bit more into this ownership. So uh, a lot of times, you know, most of us here are employees of UK. So that means we are employee authors, right? So what that means is if the work we do is in line and scope with our duties at the university, um, likely that work will be owned by the University of Kentucky. So it will fall under that corporate. So 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation. So the author in that, in many cases, is the employer, right? Under laws that we have governing copyright. So the employer owns those copyright rights. So UK would be the one that has the ability to reproduce to publicly display, to distribute. However, we do make an exception. So at the University of Kentucky, under Administrative Regulation 7.6, under the General Policy A, uh, there are several things that are reserved out. So traditional products of scholarly activity, which have customarily uh, been considered to be unrestricted property of the author or originator, are accepted from the general policy. Meaning if we have um, professors or individuals that, that write books, uh, any syllabus related to their class or any what's considered scholarly works um, are generally exempt from ownership by the university, right? However, um, if it's in line with your, your job, then it's likely the universities, for instance, you know, I head up the patent department at uh, OTC. It is my job to provide training on intellectual property matters to the UK populace. Accordingly, this presentation that I've created is not mine. I created it, but I created it for the University of Kentucky because I have a duty as a result of my employment with the University of Kentucky to assign all of my copyrights over to the university. So this PowerPoint um, that I have, this recording uh, that we're making of this webinar would all be owned by the University of Kentucky. So long after I leave, the university would have full right to reproduce this, uh, make derivative works off of it, and to distribute it however the university deemed fit. Uh, and that happens a lot with most of our employees. 
Um, so now that we know, you know, kind of where we sit from the employee side, uh, there's also some important things to consider. So the law draws a distinction between employee works of authorship and independent contractors, right? So I'm not going to get into the, the you know, the um, legal nuances between what makes an employee and what makes an independent contractor. Uh, there are many law professors that provide tests on this when you learn about agency in law school. Um, but essentially for our purposes at UK, if we are using some type of outside vendor, that would typically be an independent contractor with respect to the university. And that independent contractor, absent some agreement in writing, would own all the copyrights. So for instance, if you are working on a project and you need some coding done, or you need assistance with a website and you go to an outside vendor, if we do not have an agreement in place with them, that outside vendor will own the rights to that website. Um, however, uh, most of our services contracts done through purchasing do have in them what's known as work for hire language, meaning that we put in our contract that any work to be conducted by that vendor would be considered a work for hire and be owned by the University of Kentucky. So most of the time, if you're going through purchasing, you're going to have that level of protection. But it's also um, kind of important to remember just if you're working with a collaborator or some company you worked with for a long time and maybe you don't have a written agreement in place, any copyright created by that outside party, uh, absent some contract, they will have the right to that. So after we have this copyright, how do we go about providing people notice that we have this copyright on this work? Well, it's simple. Um, as you'll see on the bottom of the slide, all it takes is a notice on that, whether it's a website, a brochure, um, some type of teaching material uh, that you're providing out, um, you know, a movie, whatever it is. All you have to do is provide a notice, which says copyright that you're, you know, which provides notice you're claiming a copyright the year that that copyright was created and who owns it. So in this case, a copyright notice for the presentation I'm giving would read as you see, which is copyright 2021, University of Kentucky. And that date range can be even multiple. So if you have a document you're continuously updating, that could say, you know, 2019 through 2021, if there were continual edits being made to that. It would give uh, individuals notice of when the first publication was and that there were derivatives made up until 2021. All right, so that kind of is copyrights. So next we'll move to the next common uh, form of IP we have here at the university, which is patents. So at its core, what is a patent, right? Well, the patent, a patent is a right to exclude others from making, using, selling, importing, or offering to sale the patented invention during the term of the patent, right? A patent is not the right to practice the patented invention. There are many instances where someone can get a patent, be able to exclude others, but not be able to make the product themselves. Some of those, if that inventor wants to make it, they may need a license uh, from others to practice. Meaning if, you know, I, you know, there is a, a patent on a particular light source and I am getting a patent that takes advantage of that light source and maybe add some level of automation or robotics to something, but I'm using that light source. I cannot simply recreate that patented light source. I would either have to get a license to use that light source or to purchase that light source and then use it in my device. Then I would have the right to create it. Now, one thing that is important to note is that in the United States, there is no exception for research with respect to this. So if you know, another, you know, a, a company or another institution creates some new, say, chemical. 
and we want to perform testing on that and they have a patent on it, we cannot simply go into the lab and say, well, I'm just gonna recreate what they've done so I can test its properties. Um, that under our law, unfortunately, would be a patent infringement and potentially subject the university to lawsuit. Now, could you go out and purchase that chemical? Absolutely. Then you could run all the tests on it you want. But to actually go out and perform the technology covered in that patent um, would potentially be an infringement of that. Um, in other parts of the globe, Europe, for example, there are exceptions for research from institutions and even R&D departments in business are allowed to essentially infringe patents if it's purely for research purposes. We just don't have um, you know, that law in the United States. So what is patentable? So we know kind of what it is. It gives you the right to exclude. Uh, it doesn't give you the right to make, but what is it? Well, as defined, it's any new or useful process, machine, manufacturing, or composition of matter, or any new improvement thereof. So meaning it could be a new process, a new machine, a new way of doing something, a new composition of matter, or merely an improvement on an existing machine, an existing composition of matter. But what is not patentable are laws of nature, natural phenomenon, algorithms, um, and one that we'll talk about more when it comes to uh, software is abstract ideas. So if it's a law of nature, you cannot get a patent on it. If it's just a naturally occurring phenomenon, you cannot get a patent. If it's a mathematical algorithm, there is no patent protection for that. Uh, one area in particular where this has come to the forefront in U.S. case law is this natural phenomenon and kind of health sciences moving towards discovery of biomarkers for diagnosis and things like that. Numerous court cases across the country have um, reiterated multiple times that biomarkers in and of themselves are not patentable subject matter. Rather, um, a test to detect those biomarkers potentially can be, but just the identification of biomarkers themselves are not enough uh, to give something um, patentability. So we kind of know what it is. We know what can be patented, what can't be. Um, but who owns a patent? So traditionally, uh, under U.S. patent law, each inventor on a patent owns a whole and undivided interest in that patent, meaning that if you have a patent that has four inventors, absent some other duty to assign, which we will get into, would each own 100% of that patent, meaning each of those inventors could go off and start their own company and each be a competitor of one another with the exact same technology. So no one inventor has the right to tell another inventor what they can do. And that applies if that inventor has, you know, 5% of the conception of the invention or 95%. Even if an inventor has less than 1%, if they are a named inventor on that invention, they have a right to the entire invention themselves. However, if an employee inventor has a duty to assign patent rights, the employer, in, you know, for our intents and purposes, UK, would be the owner of that patent. And as employees, we all have a duty to assign that any right in any intellectual property created in on the line and scope with our employment over to the University of Kentucky. At UK, according to our administrative regulations, we have a two-part test for this. And essentially, it's very easy. The first question is, was the invention developed by a UK employee? The answer to that is yes. Then we move on to the second question, which is, were UK resources utilized in the development of that technology? If the answer to that question is, is also yes, then the University of Kentucky is the owner of that technology. So when someone submits an invention to us uh, at OTC, those are our first two threshold questions on whether or not the university owns that, right? Is it a UK employee? Was it um, 
done with UK resources. If that's yes, then we present it to the IPC. Uh, they would typically make, you know, look at that evidence, say UK owns it, and then hand it back over to OC, OTC to determine what we need to do to protect that idea or patent, whether it is actually proceeding with the patent or maybe some other form of protection. Uh, but at least the IPC determines that the university owns that technology. Uh, if the answer to one of those is no, uh, then we go to the IPC, IPC and present that fact and release that invention out to our employee. And that does happen. Someone you know, invents something in their garage that isn't related to their work at the university. They, you know, we don't want to, as the university, step in and take that away from them. That's absolutely their invention. All right, so now that we've kind of gone over ownership, how long does a patent last? Well, not nearly as long as a copyright. So for a utility patent, uh, the timing of this is typically 20 years from the date of filing. Um, so that means the date you file, if a patent is granted and it's maintained, that patent will last 20 years. After that point, anyone can practice the technology in that patent. For design patents, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit later, how they're different than utility, um, is 15 years from the date of grant. So if that patent is granted, you're given a 15 year monopoly in which you can exclude others. Now, where is a patent valid? Well, patents are territorial limited. So meaning that a US patent only applies to activities done within the United States. So if you remember back what a patent allows you to exclude others from make you sell import, those activities have to be occurring in the United States. And if you have a US patent, you can prevent others from doing those within the United States. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any global patent protection. There's no one filing we can make that gives you protection in a variety of countries. We have methods that allow us to go into foreign countries easier, and we have a global clearinghouse for that. But as far as obtaining actual patent protection globally, we have no mechanism currently to effectuate that. So now we kind of know how long they last, where they're relevant, uh, but what are some other kind of nuances related to this? So one, in the United States, we have this idea known as uh, the public disclosure grace period. So this kind of stems from pre-2013 when the United States was a first to invent country. So our patent laws operated on the concept of the first to invent should get credit for that invention. At that time, the rest of the world was a first to file country, meaning the first to the patent office typically won any dispute. Uh, and in 2013, we passed the America Invents Act and brought the United States in line with the rest of the world, and we became a first to file country. However, one remnant that, main, that stayed was a one-year grace period um, from any public disclosure to the filing, meaning that if you publicly disclose an invention, you have a one-year period in which to file a patent in the United States. Um, in order to keep that in potential for a monopoly alive. If it's more than one year past your public disclosure, that invention is dead. You cannot obtain patent protection on it. The rest of the world, however, or I should say vast majority of the world, is what they call an absolute novelty, meaning that there is no grace period on most foreign patent filings. So if your main goal was to file in Europe, um, because that's where the technology you invented would apply most to, but you disclose it one day before you file, that patent in Europe would be dead on arrival when we file. So there would be no point in filing. So you have to maintain absolute secrecy of that idea before filing in order to obtain um, foreign patent protection. Now, I mentioned design patent. This is kind of an area of, of patent law that um, most people aren't familiar with. So most people, when they think of patent, they think of a thing, right? I have 
um, you know, patents that cover how my phone operates, the signal it receives, what it can do, the information it can contain. However, people don't think on how people protect the shape of my phone, right? So design patents are there to protect ornamental design features of products. So some examples are furniture, jewelry, bird feeders. Uh, I say bird feeders because at my time in private practice, we had a client that was big in the bird feeder industry and that's how all bird feeders are protected. It's pretty common knowledge that bird feeders have a containment device to store either liquid or seeds for a bird, provide some area for the bird to perch on to access the food contained therein. Um, but the way that that bird feeder looks can be protected. Uh, and lastly, we have plant patents. So if you develop a new strain of plant, that can be protected uh, at the USPTO and exclusivity can be given for that plant strain. All right, so that's patents. Now we're gonna get into some more, not obscure, but they don't um, arise that often in the academic institution setting. And we'll kind of get into why that's, that's important. Uh, but I also want to make sure and provide this information in case we have any innovators that have a technology and are interested in becoming entrepreneurs and, you know, kind of starting up their own company with their technology. Uh, these next two pieces of intellectual property are, are vital to any company. So the first of those are trademarks and service marks. So those essentially are the same thing. It's just most people haven't heard of a service mark. But service marks and uh, trademarks are merely an indication of the source of the goods or services. So a company that is selling you a good, a widget, some thing would have a trademark. Something that covers a service covers, is covered by a service mark, right? So essentially means the same thing. It only comes down to goods or services as the source um, uh, of whatever is being supplied. So a trademark or a service mark can be words, names, symbols. Um, it could be a device, sound, color. Uh, so there's no real uh, definition as to a limitation on what can be a trademark, uh, but it has to be uh, essentially something that can be used in commerce, meaning that it can be used when a good is being sold, right? So they're typically used to distinguish your goods or services from those sold by others, right? So think of it as brand identity, right? And the images that we have, the golden arches, everyone associates that with McDonald's. That is a trademark of McDonald's. The Starbucks coffee logo, um, that is trademarked by Starbucks. When you see that, you know, that Starbucks coffee, you can think, oh, I know what I'm going to get there. That is their brand. Uh, the Peacock for NBC. NBC is another one that um, shows the diversity that can be had in trademarks. Uh, if anyone here is, can remember old NBC news programs would always come on with a three note chime. I'm not going to try to reproduce that because I'm awful. But if you can hear, you know, I know a lot of us may be able to hear those NBC chimes in our head. That is also trademarked. That series of notes that represent the chimes from NBC is trademarked. That is another trademark that NBC has. And Coca-Cola has the script Coca-Cola as well as the shape of the bottle. Uh, that was another trademark that they had for a very long time. So, we kind of know what these trademarks are. We probably encounter these more on a daily basis than any other form of intellectual property. We probably create more copyrights than we know of. But as far as encountering in our daily lives, you see branding everywhere you go. Now, unlike copyrights or patents, the term of a trademark is potentially perpetual. Um, however, to keep up that protection, that mark must be used continuously and the organization must exercise control over the quality of goods and services. 
right? So if those two elements are met, a trademark can essentially last forever. Uh, currently, right now, one of the longest running trademarks is in Europe from the brewery Stella Artois. They claim ownership of their trademark since 1366. So, you know, at, at this point, you're talking about uh, a very long trademark that would last far longer than any copyright, uh, any patent. Uh, but they, it has been in continuous use for hundreds of years. So that's trademarks. Now we come to uh, another one, even kind of more nebulous on exactly what it is. And this typically applies to businesses and we'll kind of get into why that is. So trade secrets. So trade secrets essentially cover, if you've heard the term know-how, right? Not covered by a patent, but I have some special know-how that allows me to do this or build this or make this faster or this better. Know-how is kind of a slang term for those trade secrets, right? So they can in, involve a formula, a pattern, compilations, computer software, drawings, devices, methods, techniques, or processes. Essentially, it's anything a company wants to keep secret, not make it publicly known, that provides some benefit to their product. Um, However, that can't be, you know, that can't be derived from publicly available sources, meaning it can't be out there, right? So if two famous ones that people think about, KFC recipe and the recipe for Coca-Cola, if Coke was to release their actual formula, their trade secret would go away. And those companies have to take efforts to keep it secret. And this is primarily why we can't utilize trade secrets in an academic setting. Because most of our inventions are done by our innovators that um, are encouraged to publish their discoveries, their findings, right? So that moment of publication would destroy any trade secret rights that the university may have. And that's not a bad thing, right? A university is set up to disseminate knowledge and to you know, kind of elevate that discussion in a topic. Um, but it pretty much eliminates our ability to have trade secrets and have that as a valuable form of IP. Now, with respect to a company, there is a lot of incentive to have a trade secret. Um, so with that, before I came to UK, I was um, patent counsel for a large chemical company. And one of the processes we had for making an everyday chemical was a trade secret. With that, um, you know, and we protected that trade secret uh, with some pretty out, you know, kind of this high threshold of protection. I'll kind of get into that on our next slide. Um, but that company had an incentive to have this very efficient method of manufacturing that couldn't be readily discovered by competitors so we didn't file a patent on it because a patent would only last for 20 years. And if we wrote a patent on it, everyone would know exactly what we were doing. So that company made the internal decision to keep that as a trade secret. And that's important because trade secret law will not protect you from your own revelations of your trade secret. The only thing trade secret law protects from is from misappropriation and theft. So if an employee steals that idea, takes it to a competitor, you can sue that employee and a potential competitor. But if you, as the company, disclose it yourself, that just means you've lost your trade secret. There is no recourse. One of the main things for protection of a trade secret is there has to be a plan for protection, right? So first off, you have to identify that trade secret. You have to have a routine for trade secret audits to discover these trade secrets. And you have to take steps for ongoing protection of the trade secrets, whether it's visitor logs, segregation of the trade secret from non-trade secret information, physical or virtual barriers, and NDAs related to that technology. Uh, at my previous employer in the chemical company, with this trade secret, they had three individuals in the company that each knew a part of the complete plant structure to make this product. No one person knew 
all the intricacies of the process to make this. Um, so three people, so they split it up, they kind of segregated out the information so no one person would have it. There was one server located in a basement in Germany with, and that server was isolated from the web or any other internal networks. And the only thing stored on that server was the complete plans for our plants to make this particular product that was covered by a trade secret. And access to that server was limited and long. So they put up both physical and virtual barriers to, to segregate that information from all other, other information in the, the company. So that lets you know the steps companies will take to maintain a trade secret. So things to consider for trade secret protection are one, the ease of reverse engineering, right? So if something is easily reverse engineered, there's no point in having a trade secret because the moment you make a product using that and people reverse engineer it and develop it themselves, you've now lost protection. So the harder it is to reverse engineer, the more likely a trade secret would be beneficial. And then you always have to balance that with the desire to publish on research, right? Like I mentioned in academia, there is this desire to disseminate knowledge. So if there is a desire to publish on it, trade secret is obviously not the best uh, vehicle to protect that technology. So here are some examples I wanted to go through on how these types of intellectual property work together to kind of build this web of protection around something. So we'll take a software product, for example. So copyright can be used to protect the code itself. So the actual written code that forms the basis of that program can be protected. You can file it with the trademark office. You could redact portions of it. We'll get into why that may be important but it protects the structure, sequence, and organization of that computer code. Uh, there may also be a trademark associated with the name of the software in order to give you a branding advantage, to give you name recognition in the market. Uh, potentially a patent can be used that could be used to patent the process. I put a question mark next to this because there are some questions on does the software itself rise to the level of patent protection, but we'll get into that. Uh, on our last slide. And then trade secret. So men, remember I mentioned if we copyright, we may want to redact portions. Well, we may want to redact some of that source code that goes into the copyright. So kind of the portion of the code that everything else rests on, right? We could redact that out of the copyright and then keep that as a trade secret. And contracts. Contracts can be used to handle assignments from contributors and they need to be handled for licensees with users so that you define that you own these types of intellectual property and kind of define what your users can and cannot do with that software. So if we back away more from, you know, kind of this amorphous idea of a, a software product, and just because I'm now in Kentucky, I figure bourbon would be a good example. So if I was going to distill a new bourbon, what would I be interested in? One, a trade secret right? Because recipes, ingredients, although bourbon has to have specific mash bills, there's a lot of other things you can put in there. And it's not readily apparent from a chemical analysis of your bourbon as to what temperature you heated some ingredient um, at the point in the making of the bourbon. So any recipes, ingredients, etc., could be kept as a trade secret. Well, I'm going to want a marketing campaign, so I'm going to want a trademark associated with the name of that bourbon. In addition with that advertising material, I'm going to want copyrights with respect to the website I create for it, the label and marketing material, and the artwork that I submit, you know, in any brochures or flyers or web advertisements or any in, on the label of the bottle itself. I will have copyrights in that and I want to protect those. In addition, I may also file a design patent for the look and feel of the packaging and the label. So if I want to bottle it in a very distinctive bottle, I may go after a design patent, which kind of in the trade is known as trade dress, um, and, and try to get a design patent on that distinctive bottle. And then again, with all other types of intellectual property, I want contracts, right? Assignments, NDAs, things to protect me contractually 
as well as these actual forms of intellectual property. So now we've kind of gone over this two examples, but I wanted to focus in a little bit more on software patents because this is kind of where the law and technology are having a difficult time keeping up with one another. So importantly in patent law, the Supreme Court in 2014 came out with a case that we refer to as Alice. So at its core, what Alice enabled courts to do was to invalidate a broad swath of software patents, regardless of whether or not they were novel. So we're not even getting to the question of whether or not what we're doing is new. They said these patents could be invalidated because they are unpatentable subject matter. Remember when we were going over patents and there was, this is what patents can be, you know, any new machine uh, method, process, composition of matter, but there are things that could not be protected, which are laws of nature, natural phenomenon, algorithms. Well, they included in this, this idea of abstract ideas. So the decision in Alice stated that abstract ideas are not capable of patent protection. Now, this does not mean that you cannot get a patent on software. What this means that some things are patent eligible and some are very challenging uh, to receive a patent on software. So things that courts have determined are patent eligible are, you know, if you're using novel hardware. So even outside of the software, if you're trying to get a software patent that takes advantage of novel computer hardware, that's patent eligible. If your software is more efficient software, now, when I say more efficient software, I'm not saying your software allows, by putting it on a computer, it allows it to be done faster than if it was not put on the computer. That's not it. What that is getting at there is the computer program itself does something in a different way to make it faster than all other computer programs trying to do the same thing. Right, so you have determined a way of routing decision making or using different elements to increase the efficiency of the software versus other software. Things related to cybersecurity and DRM, digital signal processing. So if you're processing it in a different way, if that software is directed towards that processing, that is another thing that's patent eligible. Anything related to distributed computing, cloud computing, um, that is currently a topic that courts have found is patent eligible. Uh, things related to image processing. So if you have ways to, to process an image that has been taken, um, that using some type of software to do that, that's something that's patent eligible. And robotics platforms. Things that have been a challenge, meaning they've gone either to the patent office and are consistently being rejected or that courts have found do not rise to the level of something more than an abstract idea. So first one and the one that was killed even before Alice is business models, right? So innovation that is not technical in nature, meaning um, I'm trying to give an example. So the insurance company or let's even back that up. So hedge funds, um, early on when software patents started to come out, attempted to get patents on the way that they would protect investments. So essentially they took a non-computer issue, a non-computer problem and simply did it with a computer. And the courts and uh, the USPTO have said, that's not enough. That doesn't get you over the hurdle of having something that's patentable. Um, and that falls into this, you know, financial services technology. So the way banking is done or things like that now are typically not something that's patent eligible. Uh, bioinformatics is something that may, may receive significant challenge. One way that it's, we're kind of getting over that hurdle now is to implement AI or um, some type of machine learning into that. Uh, but as that becomes more common, um, that will also, you know, probably not be sufficient to get us over the hurdle of patentability. And then medical devices that are simply reliant on software, 
um, that software aspect no longer is enough to, to get them over the hurdle. If the medical device itself is patentable, then that's fine. But if you're trying to just take a known device and apply some software to it and make that patentable, that's not enough. And any type of kind of advertising technology typically now is going to, to face stiff challenge at the patent office. Um, so in, you know, when I was working in private practice, we would have a number of companies that would come in and want patents on uh, ways to provide advertisement to individuals based on some study that shows, you know, they, we need to show a commercial for this amount of time, having this much elements to encourage uh, use and things like that. And now the patent office has said, you cannot get those types of patents any longer. Uh, and with that, that is the end of my presentation. Um, you know, as each of you are doing your research or you come across anything you think may be one of these types of intellectual property, uh, the OTC office will be glad to speak with you and see what we can do and assist you in protecting that and seeing how best to apply it in a commercialization sense or a sourcing sense, right? Maybe not everything is related to just making money. Maybe it's we want UK to be recognized as the source of that material uh, just to elevate um, you know, the exposure to UK and the technologies here and our office can absolutely assist you with that. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, I would be glad to take them. Thanks, Matt. We do have some questions. The first question is, did your Berg feeder client ever decline to pursue a design patent in favor of using trademark law to protect the look and feel of the Berg feeder? Why or why not? Uh, so trademark laws are, so when you're looking at the, the look and feel of something, um, trademark is valuable, but again, um, the standards for looking at that are a little bit different. So typically they wanted to go the patent route. The reason why is regardless of whether or not they were making that bird feeder at the time, they could exclude others from making that bird feeder. Right. So when you're looking at trademark, you have to be continuously using it. So let's say they came up with something. They have 15 years to exclude somebody. If, say, they only make that bird feeder for 10, right, in a trademark sense, that trademark would go away because they had stopped using that design. But with a patent, they could stop using it, but still exclude others from making it and kind of give them some some cushion and distinctiveness against other competitors in that field. So that was a discussion we would have, uh, but for them, it made more sense to go with a patent for that ability to exclude, even if they weren't making that particular bird feeder. Thank you, Matt. Um, someone had a question about what the difference between the circle, what is the difference between the circle R mark and the TM mark? All right, so the, so in trademarks, if you are registered, if you are a registered trademark um, or service mark, you can use, uh, if you, you know, on the slides, there's the circle R. So I'm sure you've seen it after some things, you'll have, you know, the capital R inside of a circle. Essentially what that means is that you are claiming a federal registration of that trademark. The TM that you see after some trademarks is notification that that you know the company that's claiming that trademark is claiming it under copyright. So I mean not under copyright, under trademark common law, meaning that they haven't filed a national registration on that. Now, unlike patents, a trademark doesn't, you know, it's more like a copyright in the sense of you do not have to file. As long as you are using that trademark. Uh, in commerce, meaning you're using it to sell goods or a service, you can claim a trademark. And the way that you provide people notice that you're claiming that trademark is put the TM after the brand that you were using. Once it's registered, then you can switch over to the circle R. Great. Um, does OTC assist uh, with obtaining trademarks for UK innovators? Uh, so, so typically we do not, and this is the reason why. So, you know, OTC does assist the university in obtaining trademarks. 
But when we're talking about trademarks, a trademark has to be used in commerce, meaning it has to be used to sell goods. Specifically, if we're talking about a federal registration, those goods have to be for sale across state lines. So even if something's only sold in Kentucky, that's not enough to give us a federal registration. So with that, what typically happens is, let's say you're an innovator in the UK, you develop a technology and want to form a startup. Um, so you form the startup and license that UK technology from UK and start that company around it. At that point, the company, the startup is responsible then for the branding because that entity would be the comp would be the entity that is actually responsible for the commercialization of that product. So they would be the owner of that trademark. Um, so you know we can kind of assist in branding of what makes sense, but as far as actually filing a trademark and maintaining it, that would be the responsibility of that outside company because they would be the owner of that mark. Right? It doesn't revert to UK. UK is not in the business of selling products like that. Um, so to, to make sure everything's legal, that would have to be owned by the company. And we have uh, one last question. How can research be conducted if a third party has a patent on a portion of the research we want to conduct? All right, so I mean, I guess anything that you want to research, it's just doing a patent search, right? So if, you know, and when I, you know, if it's a portion, it just, it just means if there's something you want to utilize or look at in your research, if it has a patent on it, right? We would discover that by doing any type of patent search. So one example we've had at the university is we wanted to see the uses of a particular compound um, with respect to different targets, right? So the, the issue that came in was, we knew that there was a patent on this compound, um, but the compound could be readily made in the laboratory. We just couldn't make it in the laboratory. And a, a patent search uncovered the fact that there was this patent on this compound. Um, so with that, the only requirement then we had was to make sure we purchased that compound from uh, a licensee that had authorization to sell it. We could get it into the lab and then run any test. So essentially the best way to get familiar with that is if you're thinking about conducting new research or unsure about the field, um, our office can conduct kind of a, a patent landscape search to kind of see what's out there, right? Um, and to see if there's any patents that um, cause, uh, you know, would cause a concern with respect to research you want to do. Now, I say that and, and put that in the slides to make sure people are aware and to encourage them to do those type of searches. But in most instances, you know, if you, if you are unaware and something happens, um, there are typically ways to reach out and say, look, we were just doing this for research. We're sorry. How can we go about correcting this? And uh, it's not an issue. It's only when uh, you continuously do it and never try to figure out if you're infringing or not that it causes problems. Uh, one famous case is from Duke University. They knew about a patent, started doing research internally related to a patented product and got sued, right? That is kind of what set the standard for you know, making sure the United States is not falling under the research exception that the rest of the world currently has. Uh, so unfortunately, a university had to get sued for millions of dollars uh, to reinforce that law and get judges to agree with it. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate you doing this presentation and we appreciate all of you being here. Please look for our May webinar that'll be coming up. We'll be advertising soon. And if you have any questions, like Matt said, please feel free to email otcinfo at uky.edu and we'll be happy to get those answered for you. Thank you and have a great day.